What's up, my squids? Today, I'm teaching you the three steps to get shredded, to get abs, to jump higher, to run faster, to do this all in an eight-week period. So that's what the Fat Don't Fly program is all about. And I'm taking you through the three most important principles that are also the three most common mistakes when most people are trying to strip off that body fat in order to jump higher and to run faster. Let's get this work. You're listening to the PJF Podcast, a show dedicated to decoding elite sports performance and fitness. I'm Paul Fabritz, and I'm an MBA strength and conditioning and performance trainer. If you want to become superhuman, take your fitness, and take your sports performance to the next level, this is the podcast for you. Let's do it. What's up, my squids? I am here. I brought my food. My food is knowledge. You guys are the squids who need food. You're hungry. You want the knowledge. You want to get to the next level. I am here. I am a zookeeper and I keep a bunch of squids in my facility. That's all I'm here for is just a zookeeper. I'm not a trainer. I'm a zookeeper and I'm bringing you the food. Let's get this work. So look, three principles to getting lean, to getting shredded, but doing it in the process of jumping higher and running faster because we're athletes. We don't just want to look good. That's the thing. Like so many people go and they train to look good and they look the part, but they actually decrease their performance because of how they got lean in the first place. So I'm going to take you through three important principles from the Fat Don't Fly program. Once you understand these principles, it can be a game changer for you and you can start to get lean the right way. Principle number one, do not neglect your fast twitch fibers in the process of getting lean. Here's what everybody does. They go, okay, I'm going to get lean. Slash the calories in half. Big caloric deficit. I'm going to cut back the carbohydrates. I'm going to maybe even cut out carbohydrates completely. Now, because caloric deficits matter, I'm going to now, instead of lifting heavy weights, I'm going to go light. I'm going to go high rep. I'm going to do circuit style weight training because I got to keep my heart rate up. So I got to rush from exercise to exercise to exercise. I got to turn my strength training into cardio. And then after that, I got to go do cardio. This is how you ruin athleticism. Okay. This is how you ruin athleticism. This is how everybody goes out and gets lean. It's not sustainable, but you are wrecking your fast twitch fibers in the process of getting lean. So in the Fat Don't Fly program, we're trying to build our fast twitch fibers while getting lean. And so from a weight training standpoint, we're still going to move some weight. We're still going to move explosively. We're still going to toss some med balls. We're still going to jump. Now, plyometric volume is much less than I would uh, incorporate in like a vert code program. When we're trying to lose weight, that's not the time to do a lot of plyometrics, right? The goal is relative strength and we're going to get to this in principle number three. But the worst thing we can do is turn everything into cardio, right? Everybody wants to rush from exercise to exercise and all of a sudden they start going really lightweight. And what they do with this high rep strength training is they start to take these type 2X fibers and they revert them back. We get these huge fiber type shifts with this high volume, low intensity strength training. And so you start to neglect your fast twitch fibers. Also, what did I mention before that everybody does? We cut calories and we typically do it in the form of carbohydrates. So you get rid of your carbohydrates. What's the primary fuel source for fast twitch fibers? phosphocreatine system, and carbohydrates, right? So the type 2X fibers, they want carbohydrates. The type 2A fibers, they're primarily glycolytic, so they want carbohydrates to fuel them. Now, they can also be somewhat fueled off of fat, uh, but you need carbohydrates for both your type 2A and your type 2X fast twitch fibers. Now, if they don't get that feel, one, they don't recover, but two, once you step into your session, your fast twitch fibers are not going to be all on deck. We're not going to be able to be explosive in the gym. We're not going to be able to lift heavy weights. We're not going to be able to move explosively to get any type of gains because we don't have the fuel for those fibers. And so that's how you become a slow twitch mess. You wreck your fast twitch fibers from the diet and you're wrecking them with your training. Now, in the Fat Don't Fly program, we do cardio, okay? We do typically three days a week of higher intensity stuff where we're heart rate zone five or zone four, 
Um, so pretty intense. And then we do three days a week of like a zone two. So that's like a slow, you know, 20, 25 minute steady state, very, very slow, which is actually really good for recovery, but it's also good for building that aerobic base. Now, some people would look at that and say, but isn't cardio going to ruin your fast twitch? Look, running marathons might ruin your fast twitch. If you start training for marathons and that interferes with your explosive training and it's going to obviously give you some fiber type shifts more towards slow twitch characteristics. But if you're going out and you're doing 10 to 25 or 30 minutes of cardio a day, whether you're getting that on the court through your sport or you're doing that through, um, you know, treadmill or elliptical or whatever it is, that is a moderate amount of cardio that you need for general health and you need to be effective in your sport. Unless you're a dunker or a high jumper, then you don't need as much of an aerobic base. But if you're a basketball player, we need that. And so I always say what I tell our athletes who are worried about that, if your fast switch fibers are actually that inefficient and that fatigable, right? You have these type 2X super fast fibers that are that fatigable where we go out and we do a 20 minute jog and they shift towards type 2A or towards slow twitch. We don't want those fibers. We don't want those in our body. Those are too fatigable. So it's not realistically going to be usable in our sport. Like if you're a basketball player, that's the type of fast switch that would be around in warmups and you would be doing the craziest dunks in warmups. Two minutes into the game, they would already be fatigued and they would not be usable. So that's not something that is sustainable in basketball, staying fresh and staying explosive through the second and the third and the fourth quarter and into overtime. Those are not fibers that would be usable. So if they are that fatigable, we don't want them. Now, what most studies would show and what my experience would show is that 20 to 30 minutes of cardio per day is not going to have a negative impact on your vertical jump, on your speed, on your explosiveness. Now, when you get into the physiology of fiber type shifts, things get really confusing. There's still a lot that we don't know about that. But just think of it this way. You need this certain threshold of conditioning to be effective in basketball. And at the end of the day, that's probably the most important quality is you being in shape. And to attain this threshold, I need X amount of cardio per day or cardio per week, whether I'm getting it through basketball or through additional cardio. That's what I need. And so don't look at things from a fiber type standpoint. Look at it like, hey, this is how much cardio I need to be in elite shape on the basketball court. Everything else comes after. Everything else is the cherry on top. Everything else is a bonus. So go do the necessary amount to be in elite shape. The good news is I've assessed the changes in hundreds of athletes. When we get them in elite shape, conditioning wise, they don't actually decrease uh, their vertical jump like a lot of the fast twitch studies uh, might suggest, right? Even when you talk to like Dr. Andy Galpin, who is a leader in this field, they would say, hey, we don't know a lot about exercise and the fast twitch adaptations to it and how that actually affects you on the court. There's still a lot to be learned about fast twitch. So we need enough cardio, but we don't want to do that cardio and then also go out and now start making our strength training into circuit style stuff where we're not getting anything maximal. We're not getting anything near maximal intent because you're so fatigued, you're getting everything at 70%. And that type of conditioning, even though you're tired doing these circuits, like strength training circuits, that does not translate to the core. It's a very, very different type of conditioning. So all you're doing is getting yourself really, really tired. And that is not going to translate like normal cardio would or running sprint intervals um, or conditioning on the court, right? So you want to keep those things separate. When it comes to strength training, you want to lift explosively. You want to be strong. You want to take enough rest periods so that you can train at a high level uh, without having fatigue interfere too much. Now, in the Fat Don't Fly protocol, we will use circuit training sometimes, but it's usually on uh, the lower intensity stuff where we're focusing on full body stability um, or maybe we are focusing on muscular endurance. That's when we're going to add in more circuits. Uh, but when we're doing big compound lifts where we're trying to move some weight or move explosively, we're going to superset them or do an alternate set 
uh, where you do an exercise, you take your rest period, you do an exercise, and then you take another minute off or another two minutes off, and then we go back to that first exercise. I want you to be fresh for these compound movements. So that's how we actually maintain or build those fast twitch fibers while we're getting lean. And then, like I mentioned before, being in a minor caloric deficit, not huge, just enough of a caloric deficit to lose one to two pounds per week while keeping carbohydrates high enough so that we can fuel those fast twitch fibers for our workouts. All right, fat don't fly principle number two, get lean the right way so that we can stay lean for the long term. And so this is something that you guys have probably heard me talk about a lot over the last couple of years, but it's so important. Now, like a lot of other trainers, I originally learned this concept through traditional studies, but now I'm actually able to study this in our athletes. We have the Pinoe device, um, which is a metabolic analyzer and it's portable. So I, I don't have to just stay on a treadmill. I can actually use this on the court. I could use this out on the turf, whatever drills or workouts we're doing. I can analyze what are we burning, how many calories, what percentage of fat compared to carbohydrates. But what we can do is we can track the metabolic adaptations. So I can see how our athletes' basal metabolic rate is week to week. And not only that, in our sessions, I can see how they are adapting session to session. So for example, if I go out and I jog 20 minutes, I burn X amount of calories, okay? I go out and I do it again, and I might actually burn a little bit less the next time. And then again, I go out and I jog 20 minutes at the same pace, everything's equal, same pace, same intensity. I might burn a little bit less. And then I go do it again, and I might burn a little bit less. And the amount of calories that I burn keeps going down. So that is an example of our body becoming efficient. And so in the creation of the Fat Don't Fly program, I was able to switch up the heart rate zones the right way so that our body doesn't build that efficiency and do the same thing every single time throughout the whole program. So we switch up the heart rate zones the right way so that we can continue to challenge our athletes and burn calories without getting those adaptations. And then not only that, we can make sure that their basal metabolic rate is staying high. So if I went out and I slashed calories and I cut carbohydrates and I moved to just doing cardio, over time, we're going to see that metabolic rate just drop. It's just going to plummet because your body always has a counterpunch, right? So you say, okay, I'm going to slash calories and I'm going to go out and do all this cardio. And your body's like, uh, no, we want to be fat. For survival reasons, we want to be fat because we don't know when our next meal is going to be. The safest thing for us to do is to have some excess body fat so that if we don't have another meal, we're, we can survive for longer. And so your body always has a counterpunch. Now, the harder you give that initial punch, the harder the counterpunch. And so that's one thing with the Pinoe device that we were able to do is find out that perfect level of punch. If we punch too hard and we cut our calories too fast and I cut the calories at a rate that I'm going to lose three or four or five pounds in a week, the counter punch from our body is so hard. And that counter punch is going to be messed with hormones so they can change my hunger hormones so that I'm way more hungry so that now I have all these cravings and I want to go eat because remember your body wants more calories because it hates this caloric deficit wants to get back to that normal weight, the other adaptation would be slow down the metabolic rate. Okay, you're burning fat way too fast. Let's hold on to this fat. I'm going to make you more hungry, and I'm going to make sure that you don't burn fat like this. So the next time you go exercise, we're not letting go of this fat that easily. And so we're going to become more efficient over time. And so what we are able to track with the Pinoe device, with our athletes, our test subjects, and with myself is how hard should we throw that initial punch? And the conclusion that we came to is that initial punch should be pretty light. So yes, the exercise program is hard, but we're eating at a caloric deficit that's gonna allow us to only strip down one to two pounds of fat. So now if we're losing at the right rate, that initial punch was soft enough that our body's counter punch is now just a little jab to the ribs it's not a full-on uppercut to our jaw that was going to knock us out, right? Everybody knows, actually, if you're listening to this and you've tried to lose fat in the past, you've probably went all in week one and got that uppercut to the jaw and just hit a wall because you were in such a big caloric deficit. 
and you probably just gained all that weight right back. And then you're probably on this constant roller coaster of I lose fat, I gain fat. I lose fat, I gain fat, plus a little more. I lose fat and I gain fat, plus a little more. Year after year, your weight is just gradually going up. So to summarize that principle number two, we're eating as many calories as we can to still lose one to two pounds of fat. So we are in a caloric deficit, but it's very, very minor. We're doing exercise that promotes maintenance of the metabolic rate. So strength training, building muscle is great for our metabolism. While we're stripping fat, naturally our metabolic rate is going to go down. When we lose weight, our metabolism is going to go down. But when we build muscle mass or at least maintain muscle mass, that metabolic drop is going to be much, much less. So now we're burning more calories throughout the day. And that's how you lose weight long term is not compromising the metabolism in the process of getting lean. And fat don't fly principle number three, relative strength is king. So I always talk about this term adaptive energy, right? It's one thing to have enough energy to go get through your workout. It's a whole nother thing to have enough energy to make an adaptation, right? People forget if I'm trying to actually adapt and build muscle and improve explosiveness and build stronger muscles, build stronger tendons, it takes energy to make those adaptations within the body. And so you have X amount of nutrients. You have X amount of resources that your body can give towards an adaptation. And we call that adaptive energy. Now, when you're in a caloric deficit, our adaptive energy is even lower than it normally would be. So when you're in a caloric deficit, anytime we're trying to lose weight, that is not the time to have training ADD and say, this is my time to go all out on agility. And I'm going to do a lot of plyometrics because I'm trying to improve elasticity in the tendons. And I'm also going to lift maximally because I want to improve strength, but I'm also going to do a ton of cardio because I want to improve conditioning. And I also want to improve my maximal sprinting speed. Now we can touch on all of these qualities, but we have to have one clear priority. And that one priority is relative strength. And when I say relative strength, I mean strength compared to our body weight. So already, if we just maintain our strength, since we're losing one to two pounds per week, our relative strength is transforming. Now, a lot of people on this program actually increase their absolute strength. So the total amount of weight they lift, or the total amount of force that they can produce on the force plates in a jump, that actually increases plus the weight drops. Now our relative strength is just being completely transformed, right? So that's what happened with me. Like my quarter squat strength transformed. I think I added like 80 to hundred pounds on my quarter squat strength. Now I wasn't doing a lot of quarter squats before, but from the beginning of the program to the end of the program, my quarter squat strength transformed while losing body weight. And so my relative strength just went through the roof throughout the eight-week program. Now, the beautiful thing is when we improve that relative strength, guess what happens? Your agility might transform because now we're making our cuts with higher relative impulse. So the amount of force we put in the ground compared to our body weight can actually go up just from that relative strength. Uh, on our force plates, we normally tell the difference. On our force plate jumps, normally our relative impulse goes up. And so we didn't have to focus on doing a lot of jumping or doing a lot of agility, we improved all of those things by improving relative strength. And so when you're on the fat don't fly program or when you're in a caloric deficit in general, you have to remember if you chase two chickens, you catch none. So that's the classic quote in strength and conditioning, which basically just means focus on one thing, kill it, go all in, and then move on to the next. Now, that isn't always the thing. When you have enough adaptive energy, sometimes you can attack two qualities at a time um, and then you can touch up on other things. But when you're in a caloric deficit, I'm a huge believer that we want to focus on that relative strength and then that's going to improve all these other qualities. Now, we're still going to do conditioning and we incorporate some sprint work and we incorporate some extensive plyos where we're introducing elasticity and gradually ramping up because I feel like those things always have to be a part of a program. Never is there a period of eight weeks in an athlete's life that I think plyometrics should be removed. I think that can be detrimental for the tendons because then they're so detrained when you get back into it, it's really hard to build up that tolerance again. And so we are touching on all of these different qualities, but we have one 
clear goal and that one priority is relative strength. Now to build relative strength, you're gonna have to be at a minor caloric deficit. If you slash calories too fast, you're not gonna have the energy to get through the workouts or the adaptive energy to rebuild that muscle. Also, we're gonna have to take long enough rest periods. We're gonna have to lift at a pretty high intensity. So we're not gonna all of a sudden go lightweight, high repetition. Occasionally we'll do some of that, but for the most part on our compound lifts, we're gonna stay pretty much under eight repetitions when we're really focused on building strength. Second half of the Fat Don't Fly program, we get down even lower. We have a lot of three sets of four, four sets of four, um, that type stuff where we're pretty low on the repetitions and we're high on the intensity. So we're moving some weight and throughout the whole program, uh, we are staying explosive. We are training the fast twitch fibers because we want better relative explosiveness and better relative strength to really transform your athleticism while getting lean. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed this little talk. I hope you guys really understand those three principles because if you have those three principles, you have the good fundamentals that you need to lose fat, to build muscle, to get more explosive in the process. Now, there's many, many, many more principles uh, that Fat Don't Fly revolves around. This is just the tip of the iceberg, but I feel like those are the three most important things that you guys need to know based on the mistakes that I see in other athletes when they're trying to get shredded and improve athleticism. So if you're ready to hop on the Fat Don't Fly program, you could head over to pjfperformance.net, click on training and click on Fat Don't Fly. We have an early bird special that saves you a lot of money. It's not gonna be live for much longer. Uh, so go sign up for that. Let's get started on this eight week transformation. Take your before and after pictures and send them to me. We're gonna be giving out big cash prizes, gear, Adidas shoes, uh, PJF merchandise. Uh, so be sure to take your before and after pictures. Most importantly, I just want you to get in the best shape of your life. I want you to get shredded. I want you to get abs. I want you to jump higher, to run faster. And I want you to do it while improving movement quality. It's only going to help your results when you get back into a vert code type of program where we're then focusing on rate of force development and elasticity and those type of traits. It's only going to accelerate your results long-term. Let's get this work.